Today we're going to take a look at how several different artists use shape and pattern to set up their composition. Because too often we think in terms of rendering right off the bat uh, or color. But the first thing someone sees when they look at your painting is the composition, how things are designed. And using shape and pattern is a big part of that. Okay, welcome everybody. Today I want to take a look at um, pattern and shapes in our painting. And it's a good idea to think of our subject matter first in terms of those patterns and shapes rather than think about our subject matter in terms of rendering. So whether we're painting a tree, person, uh, mountains, houses, we have to arrange the shapes that we're looking at and create a pleasing design or composition uh, before we can ever think about rendering. And that's you know, that's the first uh, part of painting. It's also, I think, the most important part of painting. So we're going to look at that, um, looking at some artists' paintings. And you might think, well, you know, why, why think abstractly? I have no interest in abstract design. But again, no matter what your subject is, if you can see it in terms of abstract dark and light shapes, again, shapes and patterns, um, you're going to have a better composition. And it's also easier to simplify your values when you think in terms of shape and pattern. Again, big masses, not, not small. So let's take a look here. This is a painting by Carl Moll. He was a um, early 20th century painter in Vienna, in Australia. No, Austria, not Australia. And um, here he's got these... I know, poplar trees, white trees, and he's using them, that's the pattern, these white trees against a kind of a middle value green, but also the dark part of the trees against a lighter green. So he's got light bark against dark green, but then he's got the real dark bark on the tree against the lighter green. So he's, he's using contrast here, and how he arranges these trees is what makes the design or, or the, the composition. So you can't just randomly throw them on there, although you want it to look more random. But there has to be balance there. And he's broken up these trees. If you notice, there's really not any definite um, space between the trees. They're all different. And that goes to making a more interesting pattern of trees against the green grass. If he, and it's so easy to do to line up trees and they're all the same distance between each other. And it becomes static and boring. So he's real careful here, even though it's haphazard looking, it's careful planning of how much space between the trees. And where the trees start, you know, they, they're staggered quite a bit. Some run off the bottom, some are closer to the bottom, and some start way back in here. And he's got some nice balance. He's got most of the weight here, which usually you will have one side of your painting or the other that has the most weight to it. And then a smaller weight or shapes on the other side that creates balance. Now it's not equal balance, it's not symmetrical. It's heavier on this side but it's not overloaded. It's not too heavy because of the balance of these trees on this side. So you don't want symmetrical where you have same amount of shapes in the center, same amount of shapes on the side, on both sides, equal distance from the edges. That's symmetrical. And it is so easy to turn our painting into a symmetrical painting, but we don't want to. We want to stagger them, um, have most of the weight on one side, less weight on the other to create a more of an artistic balance. But that's the pattern and shape here. Now if we look at this, I've got a filter in Photoshop. It's kind of helpful sometimes. If we look at this, kind of blur the image, um, gets rid of some of the detail, and we can see the pattern and shape better you got the big pattern of dark, darker green, lighter sky, darker green up here. 
So it kind of looks somewhat like this. You got the shape of the dark green foliage, you got the light sky in there, then you got the green pattern in here broken up by some orange. And all that's broken up by these vertical light and dark tree trunks. So now you can see it more abstractly and think more about how placement goes. And you can think also, you know, you get these tree trunks all lined up on the same line and they're all equally spaced apart, how boring that, that is. But you can see the staggered tree trunks Again, some going off the bottom, some down lower, some up higher, uh, different distances between the trees. All that works together to create more of a pattern of, of nice balance, nice arrangement um, of, the, of the shapes. But seeing it this way first, before you start seeing all the little da dashes and dots on the tree trunks and blades of grass and flowers, all that might finish a painting, but it does nothing to design a painting. It's more of these simple shapes and masses that are important first. This is another Carl Mole. He's a really good painter. Um, not very well known, but I really like his work. A lot of strong contrast. Here, the pattern that sets up the composition is the dark and light shapes of the tree that's in shadow, the trunk that's in shadow, the shadow on the ground, shadow of the background trees, against the sunlight of the water, sunlight on the tops of the trees, and taking those shapes and arranging them. I mean, obviously you're looking at something, whether you're taking a photograph or you're painting outside, you're looking at it and you're deciding where am I going to crop it. Of course, the photograph crops things for you, but so much better to ignore, ignore, at least at first, the cropping of the, of what the photograph gives you. You know where the sides are, where the top and the bottom is. Do your own little thumbnail drawings, where you change the shape. Don't just take what the photograph gives you. You might want to zoom in more, and just do a portion of the photograph. There you decide where you're going to crop it, and you decide where your dark and light shapes are. Again, looking at this one with the filter of kind of blurring the images so we don't see it so much as trees and ducks and water. Now we see it more as shape. And the balance here, this real strong dark shape on this side and these light shapes with the smaller darks on the right side, the way he's arranged that. Nothing is very centered. Everything is kind of staggered, different... Um, different sizes. You want a variety of shapes and sizes in your pattern. Um, you also want to use your pattern to kind of uh, lead the viewer into composition. Here you got the pattern of the geese, I guess they're geese, here and it kind of jumps the pattern of the geese pick up over here and then it starts picking up lines on the shapes. The edges of the shapes pulls our eye along and whether it's consciously or not, these shapes and patterns, the way they're arranged in a painting, can really move your eye around the painting. Same thing here, your eye picks up the real light pattern of the geese against the dark shadow on the ground and the water, and it kind of pulls you to the tree trunk, which the dark shape there pulls you up the tree, and these branches carry you over, and then back down, and then out again. And you want it to look haphazard, but it helps to plan these things. And I'm, you know, was not here in the 1920s when Carl painted this painting, but um, pretty safe bet that he planned out and worked out this composition, a little thumbnail drawing, at least a little drawing on the canvas first of how the viewer's eye is going to be moved around the, the painting. Here's another Carl Mole kind of a park here, nice strong color. But again, there's that pattern. If we kind of blur it, we can see it a bit better. Of the lights here, the dappled light, kind of leading you, well, kind of out of the picture, but over this way maybe and up um, 
but real strong dark and light. It's so much easier to set up your composition when I can see this big dark area here as one shape and then the light area there is another shape and then this dark shape here kind of balance over on one side. Not much of a lead in or moving your eye around with the pattern in this one. This is a painter, uh, John Beatty from uh, Canada. In early to mid 20th century. And um, you have the big pattern of dark and light here that helps set up your composition foreground shadow. Now there's a bunch of little value changes in the foreground here, but kind of ignoring that, just the rid of that, just the dark shape in front, dark shape here, even though there's some lights in there, this is still a big dark shape. And then another value shape here, and then a light shape in the sky. And again, it's well balanced. You got the big shape over here, balanced by the small shape over there. And you'll find that a lot in landscapes that, um, I forgot, um, Edgar Payne called it a steel yard, which I've never understood the name steel yard. But anyway, it's the idea of, again, most of the weight on one side balanced by a shape on the other side that's going to be small. And it's usually staggered. This one isn't staggered as much, but trees start here. This tree starts further back just a little bit. So you usually have one of these in the foreground, like the big shape in the foreground, smaller shape in the background. Or you could reverse it, have the smaller shape in the foreground and the big shape in the background. But staggering them helps. Now this is William Reichel. Reichel. I'm uh, mispronouncing his name. I think I've ever heard it said, but William Reichel, he was a California Impressionist, again, early 20th century. And you see the pattern here, real simple pattern of just dark and light. And that's what makes this painting real strong. It's not his ability to render the boats here so well, or to get all the straps on the, the Brooklyn Bridge here. It's the ability to see the big shapes, the big pattern, of and the dark water sets off the white smoke, the snow on the barges, the snow in the background here, the darker bridge, and then the lighter sky. So that pattern of light against dark in big shapes, not small shapes, is what sets up the composition. And you can see this looks fairly abstract when you put this filter on it. And that's kind of what you want. You want the uh, You want that big, simple pattern of dark and light before you start to render the big shapes, break them up into smaller details. So uh, Jack Wilkinson, he is another California Impressionist, um, early 20th century. And here you have the pattern of the white snow kind of pulling you in and up here and around, you know, it goes up the edge of the tree. These edges between the shapes is what creates line. This dark tree against the lighter snow and sky and rocks creates a line there. And the eye follows the pattern of the snow up the line of the tree, maybe the line here of the rock. In fact, it can just travel all over the place following these lines and patterns. Nice pattern here of snow against rock all over in here. And using that, again, to create those dark and light shapes. And again, the key is to vary these shapes, vary the space between them, and to divorce yourself of subject matter and just see shapes makes it so much easier. And I do these in thumbnail drawings um, where I'm simplifying like this uh, with just pencil and just getting solid masses and shapes that I can use to kind of, you know, I can change it a little bit. I can design, you know, I could have, I could have the snow coming up this way. I could move the tree over a bit, make it taller, you know, for whatever reason you could 
rearrange the shapes a little bit. You're still being true to what's there. I'm still using what's there to come up with some kind of uh, suggestion of what the light's doing. But art or painting doesn't mean copying what's there exactly. So breaking things down to these shapes really helps. This is another Jack uh, Wilkinson. Again, you can see the pattern of the snow against the dark rock, the dark trees against the light sky. Just a lot of pattern. All this light snow creates nice patterns in there. Not that you have to have snow to have good pattern either. You just need shapes and contrast to set up your composition. And the more simple you keep it in the beginning, the easier it is to come up with a good composition. Here's the filter, making it a bit more abstract. See the shapes a lot easier. I mean, even if you just did this, it's still a great, great painting. You didn't have to render it fully like this. Although I like it rendered, and I, rendering is important, but not to the design and the composition. Another C scene, pattern of the reflection, the rocks against the lighter water. You've got some strong pattern here, a line from the reflection leading you up into the painting and around. You know, it just leads you all over the place. Or you could enter the painting down here. You usually want to have your viewer enter the painting at the bottom and wind around and come back, come back out at the bottom. And that doesn't mean people who look at paintings know what to look for. And they, they don't look at a painting and say, well, I've got to enter at the bottom somewhere. But strong pattern and strong shapes of dark and light create a good design that kind of pull your eye in from the bottom. And I think you look at paintings several different ways and, and times anyway. You might look at a painting and be drawn right away to this real light area. You know, this kind of the focal point. But then you kind of go down here and you pick up these patterns and it kind of moves, moves your eye around. Um, but anyway, helps to think abstractly, seeing those patterns and shapes to uh, set up your design or your composition. Well, I hope that was helpful in understanding how important it is to see our painting first in terms of shape and pattern, instead of trying to think about rendering or even color, because it's the composition that people see first when they look at your painting. It's not how well you've rendered something. Um, but thanks for joining me today uh, and check out my video on seeing abstractly. If you want more information on how to compose more interesting compositions. And don't forget to subscribe so that you'll be notified when I post another video. Thanks for watching.